The Tom Woods Show, episode 1919. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, don't even think about missing the libertarian event of the year, the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, live in Orlando, featuring many of your favorites from The Tom Woods Show. And Michael Malice says his special surprise guest, whose identity I myself don't even know, will bring the house down. Cost nothing to attend. Register at TomWoods2000.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. We've got Karen Ann Harlos back with us today from the uh, Libertarian Party. She is the secretary of the uh, Libertarian National Committee. Do we say that you're the secretary of the LNC or the secretary of the party? It's both. It's kind of confusing, but it is of both the committee and of the national party. Okay. I just want to be as precise as possible. And we're talking because of what's been going on in New Hampshire. And I insist to you folks, I know I have some people who are apolitical or people who don't like or are not interested in the Libertarian Party, and I, I, that's fine. But I don't care who you are, you're going to be interested in this because I think it's important for people to see what's going on regardless of your involvement in the party. I think you need to see what's happening. And what's been happening in New Hampshire, it's the basis of an episode that Dave Smith did on part of the problem with Michael Heiss. Since that time, there have been further developments, so we're going to talk about that. It's just very important for us to get this out in the open. Now, just to make clear, things are moving very quickly on this issue. So this episode you're listening to has been released Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. We recorded it on the 15th. So it is possible that something occurred in the interim, but you're still going to get the basic contours of what happened. So at this point, you've done so many, well, you've done live streams, you've talked to people, you've written so yeah. much. I'm sure you're tired of talking about it in a, a, on some level, but I would like you to at least set the scene. Just give us a breakdown of what happened with the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. Then later we'll get to what the chairman of the National Party had to say. Okay. Yeah, uh, certainly. And, and one thing I want to preface it with, because something that always gives me pause when I do talk publicly about this, because I know there is a lot of apolitical people out there or people who might be on the fence, you know, oh, I was thinking about joining the Libertarian Party and then I hear this and I don't want to. But I don't believe that hiding things under the rug helps. And to me, actually knowing that there are people in the party who are willing to put this all out in the open and get the dirty laundry out where everyone can see it is a reason to join because the old parties don't do this. So I just wanted to, to put that out there because a lot of people are getting very like, oh, why are you saying this? You you shouldn't be putting this out in the open. I'm like, hiding things is what the old parties do. And I, I refuse to do that. So what has been going on is this actually all goes back to dissatisfaction over the National Party's messaging with the lockdowns, which is what you and I talked about last time. And because of dissatisfaction with the trajectory of the National Party, even going back before then with the former chair, very openly turning the party in a very left direction. And though he denies it, admitting to me that that is exactly what he was doing. People, that's how the Mises Caucus got formed. Not only, but it's one of the reasons. So due to the, all this dissatisfaction, people do what political people do. They mobilized to get in better leadership at the state level. Because the state level is really where things happen. The National Party likes to think you know, that they're the top of the heap, but they really are the tail and not the dog. Though that tail does try to wag the dog, and that's exactly what's going on in this particular situation. But so New Hampshire had a clean sweep of their board back at their convention in March with primarily people from the Mises Caucus, though not entirely, and primarily people who wanted a different kind of messaging from the state parties, a type of messaging that not everyone agrees with, just like not everyone agrees with what I consider to be weak milk toast messaging, the type of messaging that grabs attention. And they certainly have grabbed attention. And that has caused a lot of consternation from people who just didn't like their messaging. And there's been some very valid critiques of some of their messaging, though I think the 
you know, the the thunder, you know, the fire and brimstone that has, has come out over it is quite an overreaction. But at the core of most of their messaging, even if not the most artfully worded, and I'm the first to admit that a lot of it wasn't the most artfully worded, was core libertarian principles. And I think a lot of the upset wasn't really about how they worded it, but was the fact that they didn't like the core libertarian principles. Two of them, for example, they put out a post about legalizing child labor. That had been part of the Libertarian Party platform explicitly in 2002. It is still our party position that you shouldn't be making something illegal unless you can show there's some kind of harm or abuse. And we already have laws against child abuse. You don't need other you know, specific laws that also capture in its net things that aren't abusive. And they also put out a post that businesses have the right to refuse service on any grounds they deem fit, even if they're disgusting grounds. And that is currently an explicit part of our platform. People have gotten very, very upset about that because I guess some people think we need to to lie to people and hide what our actual positions are and only tout the safe and nice and fluffy positions. And I don't agree with that whatsoever. So with all of this, then came all of the scandalous and slanderous allegations that behind all of this is because the the Mises caucus is just a bunch of Nazis and racists that are trying to turn the party alt-right. And they're part of this ancient Rothbard paleo strategy of, uh, I forgot what he called it, like redneck evangelism or, or, or something like that. And it's just patently ridiculous. So with all of this whipped up, the chair of New Hampshire, who was not a Mises person, but who, full disclosure, I still consider a friend of mine, who I think is a very nice lady who is being used as a pawn in this whole situation. And unfortunately, I think is going to take the fall for other people. And that's not right. But she couldn't control her board. That happens quite a bit. That is just politics. And when that happens, and if you can't deal with that, the proper thing for that chair to do is to resign. Because obviously does not have the confidence of the board and they are not working as a good team. But instead, she decided at the urging of an unnamed person, because she actually said that she was going to resign and told a bunch of people she was going to resign. And then a person she will not name said to her, no, there's another way. I would love, I have a good idea who this person is, but I don't know for certain. And I think she should reveal it because if she doesn't, she's taken the fall. This person egged her on and put this bug in her ear. That doesn't mean she's not responsible for her own actions, but it also means she's not the only one here. You know, there's a puppet master behind this this whole thing. And I don't think it's the party chair, by the way, people thinking that's who I'm alluding to. I am not. This other way was for her to find some excuse to summarily on her own and in violation of the New Hampshire party bylaws and as a smack in the face to the delegates who elected these people who ran on strong messaging. It isn't like they ran on a different platform, tricked the delegates into electing them, and then went ahead and did a bunch of things that the delegates never knew they would do. This is exactly why the delegates voted for them for this change in messaging. So she summarily dismissed her entire board. There's all kinds of excuses for that, none of which hold up, which I'm sure we'll get into. Instituted on her own with no vote of delegates or any members of New Hampshire, an entirely new board, wrote an entirely new set of bylaws that had been voted on by precisely nobody, a new platform, and a new membership oath, meaning that none of the current members of New Hampshire are members, to her, according to her, of this alleged new party, and neither are any of the national party members who she just disenfranchised out of the party. Um, that's not how things work. <laughs> that, that's not how things work anywhere. You know, it, you know, you're, you're envisioning that Geico commercial. That's not how this works. Right. You know, so she apparently earlier on June 7th, had gotten a letter from the party chair 
and I don't know if you even want to go into this part at this point, but you can cut me off. But saying that she was the chair of the only recognized affiliate in the state and is authorized to act on behalf of the affiliate in the state, which in isolation is a fairly routine letter that the chair could write for anybody. But in this context, we have to know what that has to mean. Exactly. And she told me, because I I did an informal interview with her, which I'm getting skewered for, but I would have gotten skewered for it. No matter, I would have gotten skewered no matter what I did. I realized that going into it and which I did not put words in her mouth. In fact, I said to her, Gilletta, please, please tell me if this characterization is correct. I do not want to put words in your mouth. Did you somehow, because she had said that she never thought anyone was disaffiliated, which surprised me. I'm like, okay, because that's what I thought. She said she considered this letter to be a transfer of affiliation from the party chair, from the old Libertarian Party of New Hampshire group, which still exists, to this new party that she was in the process of forming. And if not directly said, because I'm not so sure she directly said, though some other people are saying she did. Everyone will have to listen to the recording for themselves. She certainly implied that the chair knew full well that is what this letter was for. And on June 12th, she published this letter and her announcement of the formation of this new party and said that letter was the proof that she had the authority to do this. And the party chair has never repudiated that. Even his recent response, he didn't repudiate that, which if somebody used a letter of mine to do something so outrageous, the first thing I would have done is repudiate it. And it's now been three, four days and he still hasn't. He spent more time attacking me than dealing with the background context of this letter. In isolation, the letter is perfectly fine not in the entire context, particularly since Gilletta maybe outright said and at least certainly strongly implied that the party chair knew exactly what she was doing at that time, that this wasn't merely about a potential battle over control over a Twitter account, which is what our party chair is now saying, which actually like makes no sense. Write the letter after Twitter asks for it. So right, right, right. Well, let's, let's this whole thing. Well, let, let me ask you just for to play devil's advocate here to deal with some of the claims that were made about the kind of people that uh, Gilletta Jarvis had to deal with, because they're claiming that these were uh, people of bad will who did not have the party's best interest at heart, who allegedly wanted to run uh, uh, to abstain from running libertarian candidates in, in at least some cases and let Republicans run instead. I have somebody saying that they failed to file the the paperwork with the New Hampshire Election Authority, which was a big problem. So that fails to maintain the party as a going legal concern and and that their social media people were extremely insensitive and and right wing and whatever, you know, that kind of, these are the things that are being said. Now, but now my my feeling about that is, Number one, I think it's probably all, all fairly exaggerated, as everything coming from this wing always is. But secondly, that's why you have elections. These people were elected. There's obviously people who want these people running. So then next time you run other people. Yeah, you, you've you pretty much nailed it. Yeah. Basically, what it comes down to is we don't like these board members. So they were elected. For the past two years in Colorado, I'd been very unhappy with our board. I didn't try to do an illegal coup to take over the board. I waited till the next election and I voted them out. That's how things work. These people ran on this kind of messaging and were elected. Nobody is contesting that these elections were va- weren't valid. Just a certain group decided they didn't like the elections, so they're doing underhanded means to try to overturn them. That is completely corrupt. Now, I'm not, I got to be really careful because, again, I don't 
think Gilletta really understands the full implications of everything. And some people might say I'm being a Gilletta apologist because she's my friend. Okay, maybe guilty as charged. If, if, if my crime is being too good of a friend, I'll live with that because I, I do think she's being used by people who aren't quite as innocent. So yeah, you, you've pretty much nailed it, but we can, let's go through some of these things. Yes, some of their tweets were insensitive. So vote them out. I mean, put on your big girl knickers. You win some, you lose some. That's just like, how would you like, how would they like it if I tried to just take over the national party? Because I think the national party sucked on messaging for the past year. Yeah. No kidding. That's not how it works. I don't all of a sudden say, I can say the whole LNC, you're all fired and I'm going to institute a whole new LNC and write my own bylaws and you're going to suck it up, buttercup, and like it. Well, and, and we'll get to it later, but in the, the letter that did eventually come from Joe Bishop Henchman, the uh, the chair of the, the LNC, he was saying that uh, if if this kind of wing were to be victorious, it would lead to a libertarian party I would certainly not want to be a part of. Well, welcome to my world, Joe. <laughs> you know, that's what that's what I've been living through for basically forever, is a, a party that is embarrassing me at every turn and misses the biggest opportunity of our lifetimes to distinguish itself. Because frankly, I think Joe probably on balance, this is just a guess, I think on balance, he probably favored a more or less Faucian strategy against the virus, which means lockdowns. I think in his heart of hearts, he otherwise the outrage about it has to overwhelm you. And yeah, you have to say something. And there's like nothing coming out of these people. So, so yeah, yeah. Now you know what it's like to be in a party where you feel like an alien. Oh, no, I, and I can't prove this, but I tend to think you're right because before all of this happened, um, before he was chair, he told me he's not against mandatory vaccination. So when you're, listen, I know there's other libertarians that think that. This is just a fact. You know, you can draw whatever conclusions from that that you want. Some people think that's an evil position. Some people think that's a great position. Draw your own conclusions. I'm just stating a fact. And that was one reason why I was not, in favor of it's it's no secret that I did not vote for him as chair. And it's no secret that he did not vote for me as secretary. There, there's no problem with that. But one of my main reasons was leading up to this, I found out he's in favor, this is before COVID, that he was in favor of mandatory vaccinations and opposed the party ever taking a stance against them. Now our social media team on the national party who who has on Facebook, who kind of has a little bit more of a free reign. They're not micromanaged. There's a guy there who heard about this and started putting out messages against mandatory vaccination. And to his credit, he didn't pull those messages. Um, maybe he just didn't want to fight that battle. But personally, that was a position he expressed to me. And I thought that was appalling. I think that's one of those, not litmus tests, because I don't do the litmus test thing, but it's one of those things that will cause me not to vote for somebody. Yeah, yeah. Well, meanwhile, you mentioned in a video of yours that the bylaws for this, whatever you want to call rump, Libertarian Party of New Hampshire, whatever you want to call what the chair is now presiding over, has a set of bylaws that are not the kind of bylaws that just get written up overnight, that were written by people who know how to write bylaws. Like, this is not the action. This can't possibly be the action of one person uh, just taken at a moment's notice, that this was planned by more than one person. Oh, uh, yes. And writing party bylaws is not the easiest thing. It takes a certain skill. I've, I've written party bylaws. I don't know if Gilletta has that skill, but I do know people that I am fairly certain are involved in this that definitely have that skill. It generally takes people who have a legal background. I have a legal background. And again, I'm not saying it was the LNC chair who is a lawyer as well. There's a lot of freaking lawyers in this party, unfortunately, sometimes. All in right. politics, there's too many lawyers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, look, I think we, we probably should go over now into some of the points raised in the letter. Um, but could we, though, some of the justifications you gave? Yes, yeah, oh, I, sorry, I yes, let's it, get to those. Yes, let's get to those. Go ahead. Okay, so we, we dealt with the first thing, it being they didn't like the messaging. Too bad, so sad. They're, 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 they're duly elected. The other thing that they allegedly didn't file with 
New Hampshire. Ken Molman, the party vice chair, has posted on the LNC list that this is false. He has posted oh. proof of the filings. The former treasurer of New Hampshire wrote me and said, this is false, that there's nothing out of order here and that the buck stops with the chair. If she really thought there was a filing that was missed, she could have made the filing. If she really thought there was a filing that was missed, this seems like almost setting something up. Mm. Like, I know this needs to be done, but I'm not going to do it so that I can purposely blame it on somebody else. The buck stops with the chair. She could have made the filing. She could have asked the former treasurer to make the filing. It isn't like only one person in the world could have done this if it was true. And it is not, in fact, true. New Hampshire only requires certain filings if you're running certain campaigns, which they were not doing. And nothing in the national bylaws requires a state party to be, this is going to sound really strange to people, but because of ballot access and minor party laws, not every libertarian party in the country is an actual recognized political party in their state. There's nothing in our national bylaws. Let's pretend that New Hampshire wasn't a recognized political party and they have lost ballot access prior to this term. That's not required to be an affiliate of the national party. And in fact, there's weird laws in Massachusetts where they couldn't even call themselves the Libertarian Party. They had to call themselves the Massachusetts Libertarian Association. So that is completely bogus. Our national bylaws do not require that whatsoever. The other thing, uh, I forgot now. <laughs> you, oh, you, oh, okay. you had a list. Of- well, let's see. So we had the messaging. We had the, the failure to file alleged. And I guess the idea is that they, these are, oh, they didn't want to run, that's what it is. They didn't want to run libertarian candidates all the time. Yeah. Okay. That is interesting because that has been a legitimate debate within the libertarian party. Do you run a libertarian in a race where there is a quote unquote good liberty Republican running? Let me say for the record, I do not believe in anything called a good, I don't believe there, I know people are going to get mad. I'm telling you my opinion, but I don't believe in good Liberty Republicans. I think they, you, you can't be part of that corrupt organization and be called good. My opinion, take that for what it's worth. However, many people in the Libertarian Party disagree with me in good faith. In fact, I was at the Florida convention and on this very same day where we're condemning New Hampshire For having this position, the new golden child of the party, Justin Amash, whom I admire, and I think he is legitimately the new golden child, I think he is fantastic, was in his keynote address arguing for that exact same thing, that if there's a good liberty Republican in a race, that we should not run a libertarian candidate. So I am waiting for the chair to condemn Justin Amash, which we know will never happen. So that's a strategy that many parties, many libertarian parties have taken. What made it weird in this situation was that the race in which they thought there was a good liberty Republican was a ballot access race. But this party has already lost ballot access. So this isn't about retaining ballot access. It's about potentially regaining it. And there's no guarantee of that, by the way, if this guy is such a quote unquote good liberty Republican. And this comes into attention in the party. And I fall on a different side. I philosophically disagree with the New Hampshire people, but that doesn't mean that you throw them out of the party. It comes down to, are we in this for the party for the sake of the party, or are we in this for greater liberty? And will greater liberty come from getting ballot access this term by potentially causing a Liberty Republican to lose by beating the spread, or will greater Liberty come by having a governor that might invalidate these restrictive ballot access laws? People are too one-dimensional in their thinking. It might be better for ballot access for New Hampshire to have a quote-unquote Liberty Republican who could work towards overturning them. We don't know this. History is complicated. You pull one thread and you never know what the ripple effects are. And that is up to the libertarians in New Hampshire to decide, not us. 
And not to mention, a question of strategy. Is, we're not talking about uh, do we believe in non-aggression or not. We're not uh, the Questions of strategy. It's not to say that they're never questions that ought to divide us to the point of complete alienation because you, I suppose somebody could come up with a, a strategy that would clearly be working against our, our best interests. But, but when you, as you say, when you have good, decent people on both sides of a question that does not come down to a matter of libertarian principle, but is simply a question of, well, given that we have a state and we have a political system, what's the best way to manage it so as to maximize liberty? Well, you know, I, I, I can see people having differences of opinion that are quite honorable on this. And, and, and we can debate them and sort it out through, through open exchange. That's how we ought to do it. Correct. And this strategy has, this has been since the beginning of the party. Even Dave Nolan had argued before not to run libertarians in certain races. So th th that's completely disingenuous. So then, because I think people know it's disingenuous, they say, well, they were going to endorse that Republican. Actually, there's a, a public folder um, and in it are screenshots that Ms. Jarvis provided to me where you can say they explicitly said we are not saying to endorse him. We are only saying not to run a libertarian. And in fact, our party bylaws do not prohibit individual libertarians from endorsing Republicans. I don't think you should do that. But and in fact, interestingly enough, and I'm not naming names here because I have to investigate this, but some people are saying that there have been party staffers or at least party contractors that seem to be at worst endorsing a, a Republican or at best giving them like aid and comfort or, you know, whatever kind of hyperbole you want to use. So this is not something limited to New Hampshire. There's such hypocrisy going on here. So they specifically said as a party, I, we are not saying to endorse. That is against the bylaws. No libertarian party can endorse a Republican. And they specifically disavowed that. But they as individual libertarians, not in their official capacity, are free to do so. And in fact, one of the people that wrote that really disgusting, slanderous email from Dr. Kyle Varner that was posted to the LNC list, he openly endorsed Joe Biden. But we're not condemning him. And he's a speaker at so many Libertarian Party conventions. It's because as an individual Libertarian, you have the right to do that if you want to. I don't have to agree, but you have that right. You're not bound. Only the party itself in its official capacity is bound. And those people made it clear that they were not wanting the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire to endorse a Republican. And here's the thing. Let's say all of these bad allegations were true, which they're not, as I've said. The National Party has only one option when it comes to dealing with a state party they think has gone off the rails, disaffiliation. That's it. We only have the nuclear option. So if the state if the national chair was so aggrieved by what he believed to be these infiltrators, these people that were turning this party into something that he would never want to be a part of, and that was going against our fundamental principles, then he should have brought a motion to disaffiliate them. That is the proper course of action that is allowed by our bylaws. But he didn't do that. And he still hasn't done that. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Blinkist. Now, by listening to The Tom Woods Show, you are already helping to become a better version of yourself. But if you want to continue along that path, be a more confident, knowledgeable you, well, the fastest way to do it is to get learning. Learning about a new topic or skill or revisiting one you learned about before or getting up to speed on something everybody's talking about right now. Well, that's where the Blinkist app comes in. Blinkist takes top nonfiction titles, pulls out the key takeaways, puts them into text and audio explainers called Blinks that give you the most important information in just 15 minutes. So you can use Blinks to learn about topics like philosophy, history, science, dive into fields like psychology, health and nutrition, personal growth. I like Blinkist because a half hour drive can mean I've consumed the equivalent of two books. And lately I've been delving into some old authors like Machiavelli's The Prince and Seneca's Letters from a Stoic. 
Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. Let me ask you just straight out. Is there any reason to think an I like to be as as charitable as possible in assessing the motives of other people. So I don't automatically assume the very worst. Sometimes I get people emailing me saying, the reason so-and-so is attacking you is because of this and that. And I said, well, maybe, but I can't prove that. So I'm not going to say it and I'm not going to dwell on it. But I wonder, it seems to me, and I think it seems to a casual observer, that what's actually happening is that in a number of states, People in the Mises Caucus have had a lot of energy, a lot of young people, a lot of new members, a lot of excitement, and frankly, a lot of numbers. And it looks to me, and I think it would look to an impartial observer, as if this was a matter of, well, yes, we did lose fair and square, but doggone it, we're going to hang on to, we're going to keep the party in the vision that, that, that we prefer. And so in order to do that, we're just going to get rid of these, of these executive committee members. That's certainly what it looks like to the general public. Oh, I think it more than looks like that. I don't think this requires like any kind of weird imputation. I mean, it's obvious. To me, the the direct analogy is what we are doing right now in the Libertarian Party is a direct an- analogy to what the Republican Party did to Ron Paul's supporters. Yeah. They didn't like that energy. And it's funny because it's the same Ron Paul supporter type crowd but now the Libertarian Party is doing to it. And we love to tut tut for years about how awful the Republican Party was for treating the Ron Paul supporters for, for that. And we're doing the exact same thing. And something I want to make abundantly clear, and anyone who's followed me who's honest for any amount of time knows this is true. I wouldn't care what caucus was being targeted here. I'd be defending them. Yes, that's absolutely true. And Anyone who's honest would, knows that that is true. There's a few people who will deny it, but it's true, okay? Like, anyone honest knows that. So this has nothing to do with it being the Mises Caucus. Well, let me back up. Though I won't want to say absolutely nothing because I at least have the luxury of knowing that these allegations are false. Where with another caucus that I didn't know as well, I'd be defending them more on principle that you don't, purge people, but I might not have the intimate knowledge of them like I happen to enjoy with the Mises Caucus. That's the only difference, is that it, at least I know I am on the side of the angels that these are not racist and Nazis. Yeah. But I would be defending the Socialist Caucus against this if they won fair and square and weren't violating their bylaws. Even though I would fundamentally philosophically disagree with a lot of what they said. I would be saying the exact same things. I do not believe in purges. And in fact, in one of this whole thing, a a rabbit trail people have gone down is that there is a member in New Hampshire, Jackie Perry, who was expelled out of the party. Mm. I don't believe in expelling people from the party. And in looking at the case, I actually do think she was probably expelled improperly. I'm not so sure she got due process under Robert's Rules of Order. I don't know that for sure. And Jackie Perry hates my guts. I'm not saying this out of any like friendship for Jackie. She's done some horrible things to me. But the funny thing is, I'm kind of on her side on the fact that she didn't get a fair hearing. Not that that has anything to do with this, because that's an internal New Hampshire thing that they have to deal with. The National Party has to stay out of it. But that's just what's so funny about the whole thing. Like, I don't care if I like somebody. That's not a prerequisite for me looking at the justice of the situation. Look, you have been as impartial as anyone could possibly be, I think, especially as I've really gotten to start following you over the past year. Like, for example, when a lot of people were unhappy about what happened in Pennsylvania, you were a real stickler about the rules and explained that nothing untoward happened to him. And yes, okay, maybe they appealed to a rule they haven't used much, if ever, but the fact a rule's a rule. And so go back and be a better strategist next time. Yeah, don't cry because they followed the rules. And a lot of people were insisting that the state chair, Steve Sheets, was acting in malice. And 
If I were to be this Mises cheerleader, I would have agreed, but I do not agree. I was up there sitting next to him. I heard his thought processes and saw everything going on, and he was not acting in malice. He absolutely was not. And it's Steve Sheets and I have had an on again, off again friendship. He endorsed someone else in my secretary's race. If I wanted to be all butthurt and like, you know, get even, I could have easily thrown Steve under the bus, but that wouldn't have been right because he was not acting in malice. I have to call it as I see it. Well, it's it's helpful that you said that at the time, because as I say, it's it's it continues to be evidence that you don't play favorites. Now, it may be that maybe you agree with some people more often than you agree with other people. But when it comes to how they're treated, that's what I'm talking about. When it comes to how they're treated, you want to make sure that everybody gets the procedure that they're entitled to and so on and so forth. Now, let's move over and say a little something about the JBH letter. Because in this letter, and there are, there are a number of things you might want to address, but is the... St- <laughs> Here I was about to say the strong implication. It's it's more than a strong implication. The black legend about the Mises Caucus is on full display here. And I know these people pretty well. And it seems to me that they are the kids of the Ron Paul Revolution. They're young kids who are exceptionally well-read, very knowledgeable about a wide variety of subjects. They're not just frankly shit posters. They're, they're not people who know three slogans or whatever. They're smart, they're well-read, they have principles, they have their issues they want to talk about they feel like are not being talked about enough. They want to talk about things that the other, they don't want to just be 10% better than the other two parties. They want to talk about things the other two parties aren't talking about at all because that's what a third party ought to do, yeah. is not just be great on everything, but talk about the stuff that everybody else is silent on. And incidentally, I keep seeing posts from the Libertarian Party of Oklahoma saying, look, and I know you don't like the takeover language, and I know that that's uh, debatable, but the point is I've seen people in Oklahoma saying, well, we were quote unquote taken over by the Mises Caucus, and the result is our party is more robust than ever. We're on fire over here. And I would say the same thing in Colorado. And for JBH to downplay that and act like, well, they strongly imply that uh, that we're a bunch of this, that, or the other thing. You know, at the Mises Caucus event in, in 2018 that they had, at night after the proceedings of the national convention, I actually got up there and I actually went through all the various planks of fascism. And I said, I don't see anybody who is more strongly against all these things than the people in this room. Now, unless fascism means just people I don't like, which to the left, it does mean that. And so it's very embarrassing to see libertarians fall to that level. Now, JBH did not use the word fascism. I'll give him that. He's, he's, he does have an IQ above 65, so he wouldn't use the word fascism in that context. So good for him. But to see people- He's a very smart lawyer. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right. But to see people in the libertarian world falling to that, stooping to that intellectual level, what I mean, come on. If you're going to actually use the the rhetorical tactics of the left, it doesn't look good. Now, anyway, let me let you talk now. Yeah, yeah. He 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 certainly. It's funny. Out of one side of his mouth, he says he's not taking sides, and that he ran for chair to stop. You know, basically the legacy of our former chair, who had just picked fights with you and other people all over social media and that he was repudiating that tradition. But all he did in that letter was pick sides. He basically shown that he cannot represent everybody in this party, that he came out as party chair pretty much against the whole caucus. And due to that, I don't think he can be neutral as a party chair. I don't think he can represent people. And I personally think he needs to resign. He won't. And the LNC won't ask him to. But that doesn't stop me from having that opinion. I'm sure he probably thinks I should resign. But I think I have a track record of being fair to all people, whether or not I agree with them. I could be wrong on my opinion, but I come by my opinion by good faith. And I don't ever want to purge people from this party. I might disagree with them, but I even say, hey, you know, the libertarian socialists belong here. We're going to beat them fair and square on the battle of ideas. And as long as they don't misrepresent what the party platform is, you don't have to agree with the party platform 100%. So, 
he just basically came out swinging against other libertarians. And that's completely inappropriate for the party chair. It was inappropriate for Nick Sarwark to do it. And, J- and, and, and JBH just, I thought Nick was bad with that. JBH just said, hold my beer with that letter. And then he spent a portion of the letter trying to address the concerns and spent the rest of the letter attacking me, which is again, inappropriate speaking from the chair. And let me define what I mean by that. I don't mean him. I mean, he's in a position called the chair. It's like speaking from the dais, you know, speaking from the bench, you know, type of thing. So speaking from the position of chair, from the seat of the chair, for him to just openly attack one member of the LNC when I'm not the only person who has criticized him and I should have every right to criticize him is completely inappropriate. How can I ever feel that he will rule rule neutrally if I should ever have to appeal one of his rulings or if I have to ask for a point of order? I absolutely cannot. He completely abandoned any trust that the body can have that he will be able to rule fairly in my case, because he said, Karen Ann and others, who are these others? Why did you just single me out? And the fact is he has consistently done that. He has consistently singled me out. I know I can be brash. I know some of my language is intemperate, but the funny thing is I'm almost the identical twin of another LNC member, John Phillips, yet nothing ever gets sent to him. And I know some people in your audience will not like this. And I know some people will say that I'm playing the victim, but I've seen it over my six years that there is a soft sexism on the LNC where outspoken females get singled out and the men who are equally outspoken are not. And you could go all the way back in the history of the LNC. I'm not the first woman to say this. Interview Angela Keaton. She'll tell you. And people can disagree with me on this and go, wow, 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 poor vagina, whatever. That's fine. They can do that. But I'm honestly telling you how I feel. There is a reason. Why is it always me? I am not the only person who gets intemperate on the list. You know, I got a potty mouth sometimes. I think John Phillips and I sometimes have a contest to see who can drop the F-bomb more. We don't do that on the list. There's a time and a place, just like I don't do that on your show. There's a time and a place. But it's funny how I'm always the one singled out. The moderates never get called out for their indecorous behavior on the list. Yet, I do. And when I do, most of the time, it's called for. I was indecorous, guilty. I'll own my when, when it when I get out of line. But I have to say, that I am very, very frustrated that there is a definite favoritism in pecking order and people are not treated equally there. I'll own my, I'll own my mistakes, you know? And people have called me over the past few days, funny, both LNC members and non-LNC members saying, do you realize that there is a concerted effort on the list just to push your buttons? They're trying to get you to say something so bad so that they can have cause to remove you. I go, I know damn well that's happening. And they won't succeed because I know where the line is. But it's a shame that other outsiders are seeing this. So many people are seeing that I'm treated differently. And I know my haters can be, wow, wow, wow. She's playing the victim again. But you want to know what? Sometimes you are the victim. And most times I don't play the victim because I give as good as I get. But when someone's in a position of power over you, you can't give as good as you get because it's it, they hold they hold the proverbial mic button and when the chair openly attacks a member of his board that person is no longer fit to be chair well I, first of all i want to tell people that i'm going to link to this letter that we're referring to so they can read it for themselves that'll be on the show notes page which is tomwoods.com/1919 so yes you are mentioned by name he says that you and a few others have quote, tried to somehow make this about attacking me. It is obvious what she is doing and why. He he says, but the fact is at this point, she has obviously clearly substantively interfered in New Hampshire more than I have. The only action I've taken here was indisputably proper and even routine, providing a letter I would provide to any state chair that I couldn't not provide, stating a fact that no one disputed on the date I issued it. Now, now that's just disingenuous. (laughs) It's, it's completely disingenuous because it's the underlying context. And it's funny, he always says you're not allowed to impute motives. He just imputed all kinds of motives to me. He's, he, he's alleging that everything I did was in good, was in bad faith. 
he violated his own rules of decorum as chair. Yet he's not gonna he's not gonna scold himself. That was completely and utterly improper. The reason I have criticized him because I think he legitimately has violated our party bylaws and that he has, and he's almost admits it and he doesn't admit the bylaw thing, but he almost admits this next part and is trying to purge a group of people from the Libertarian Party by by making them feel unwelcome, saying they're unprincipled and not libertarian. That's almost indisputably true. I don't have to guess at any of that. He said that in his letter. And I have a duty to defend an affiliate that I believe is under attack by the LNC. We are not to abridge the autonomy of an affiliate. For him to say, I've interfered more, that is such lawyer language. Doing an investigation is not interfering. Interfering is where you give grounds to the state chair to take one of your letters and say, this justifies my coup. That is interfering. And anyone on that side of the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire would come on your show and tell you that every single time I asked her for advice, what should we do? I say, I cannot advise you. I can. I am only here to deal with your interfacing with the national party. If I advised you what to do legally, or you should do this, or you should do that, I would be interfering in the autonomy of an affiliate, and I cannot do that. There are dozens of people who will swear to that. And if this ever, God forbid, comes down to a legal issue, those people will swear to that in deposition. I have never interfered in their autonomy. And the chair is propagating an absolute falsehood against me. And if he believes I have, then I have violated the bylaws and let him institute an action against me. He won't do that because he knows he doesn't have the evidence. I hold the autonomy of the affiliate almost as a sacred duty. You do not do that. And one reason why I have that so sacred is because that's the whole reason I ran for the LNC in 2016. The LNC once screwed with Oregon and interfered with Oregon. And I said, if they did that to Oregon, they could do that to Colorado. And I got on the LNC to protect Colorado. In protecting New Hampshire, and when I was also protecting Kentucky, I was protecting Colorado in proxy because I viewed them as that could be Colorado. My motivations are quite simple and transparent. I will always protect an affiliate from the overreach of the LNC. And some people have said you shouldn't be speaking out because it could have potential legal implications for the national party. So I guess you protect the party from wrongdoing at all costs. Yes, you know, that's when I start seeing the word party in capital letters, as I say, and I start thinking of communism. Think of the capital P party, comrade. No, that's not me. If the party is doing wrong, I consider what I am doing a whistleblowing function. Others may disagree and think I have some kind of grandiose view of myself, but I'm telling you my motivations. I am speaking out even if it might be unwise because I consider myself a whistleblower. I am speaking out to protect every single affiliate in this party from potential overreach of the LNC. What happens if, as seems at least possible, the LNC more or less approves this or by not issuing any kind of corrective allows it to go on, does this wind up in the courts? Well, it could because here's what's interesting. There's data involved because we started to become a grown-up political party a couple of years ago. And this was instituted under Nick Sarwark. I will give him every credit for this, where we started to have a national database of all of our members and donors. So that's what grown up political parties do. And so the national party for economies of scale, because each individual state party couldn't afford to do this. Colorado is paying over $4,000 a year for Nation Builder, which is untenable for some of these smaller state parties like Wyoming and so forth. So the National Party provided the database to the affiliates for free. It's a huge value. But that also means that the National Party controls the access to the database. So right now, the legitimate affiliate in New Hampshire 
they've been locked out of all of their data. And all of that donor data for New Hampshire is now being shared with an illegitimate affiliate. There are some huge legal implications there. The National Party, I have already made the formal demand give back that website to the legitimate affiliate. But at the minimum, flip the switch, flip the switch till we can straighten this out. Because every second that data is being given to people who were not duly elected at convention, we are releasing hundreds, I, maybe I don't know how many pieces of data are involved in New Hampshire, but thousands of people's privacy and personal information is being breached right now. This is serious legal shit. Sorry. Well, no, I try not to curse no, on it's your show. But no, I did it first, you know, I, <laughs> earlier on. Yeah, I was a bit shocked there. Yeah, I was yeah. like, yo, go Tom. But. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's you. Influ- who knows where, where that's all coming from, but it doesn't matter. But, but look, I'm a bad influence. But look, Porkfest is coming up next week. And I'm sure normally, well, I'm not sure, but it wouldn't surprise me if the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire had in the past had a presence there. And now this throws that completely into turmoil because who would be there? And and if it's the if it's members of the executive committee who have been purged, they don't have access to data. How do they recruit people? The whole thing's a fiasco. It is. I wish I was going to Porkfest. Oh, now I definitely wish I was going because I'd be going to speak out. But, you know. Well, I'll tell you something. It wasn't in the cards. Let, let, me, let me tell you something about Pork Fest. For years and years, I didn't go. And it was partly because the dates never, it was just like well, every single year would be like the worst possible time or I'd have a child's birthday. Or and I've always pledged I will never, ever miss a birthday. And so, you know, I, I just couldn't make it. But then also there was a part of me that thought, I don't know how hospitable pork fest is to a schmuck like me. I don't know if it's really my kind of thing. So I went last year simply because it was occurring and it was 2020. There was a libertarian event that was taking place. And I thought for that reason alone, I have to go to support these good people. I I mean, I've spoken at their Liberty Forum they have in February and risked getting snowed in for a week. You know, I did that, but I'd never been to Portfest. So I went last year and it was the greatest time ever. It was so wonderful with, with, with terrific people. But, you know, there are some people who might think that Porkfest might be a place where maybe maybe old, the old man here won't be the most popular speaker. Well, I was keynoting it last year, and I'll tell you something. When I was introduced, before I even said a word, everybody was on their feet cheering. There, there, there were no gr- grumpy hall monitor types there. Yeah, you know, well, you know, in 1977, he said, you know, what? it was none of that was that happened. Every, I was given a hero's welcome there. So I have a feeling, not that I'm a, necessarily a proxy for you know the, the good, decent element in the Libertarian Party, but I have a funny feeling that means there would be, at Porkfest, very strong representation among people who favor the actual elected officials of the state party. That's my hey, guess. I would think so as well. And I, you know, I'm sure, listen, right now I'm at the point where everything I say I get criticized for, and that's fine. I signed up for this. Welcome to my um, world. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I, it's, you know, some of it is quite vicious and I'm not going to act like it doesn't bother me, but I did sign up for this. Open invitation to the organizers of Pork Fest. You want to bring me out as a speaker if you got room? I'm currently, uh, I have a completely open schedule. Get in touch and I'll come out. You know, if they, uh, but I'm unemployed at this point. So it's you bringing me as a speaker. And I'm sure now there'll be all kinds of conspiracy theories where now the organizers of Pork Fest are bribing me or something. I'm just saying I'm willing to come talk on this topic or any topic, really get in touch. I have an open schedule. I would love to because this needs to get out there. But at this point, I'm not, I'm not going, though I really, really did want to go to Pork Fest. It sounds like a fantastic time. Well, is there anything, I, I want to make sure you feel like you've said everything you want to say. Is there anything we've left unsaid that you want to add? Wow. Um, well, there's supposed to be an executive committee meeting tonight. Um, whether that happens or not, I don't know, because unfathomable to me, one of the members of the executive committee has moved to cancel the meeting for tonight. <laughs> I think the people in New Hampshire deserve an official meeting on the record to at least get this 
discussion started. I know one of the reasons they want to cancel is because there are full LNC meetings on Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday is a long time when you're dealing with not having your data, when you're dealing with not knowing your status. In fact, the LNC meetings Friday and Saturday may turn out to be not needed if the chair at an executive committee meeting clarifies that he did not constructively disaffiliate, that the people who were duly elected under the bylaws in March are the proper party, and he's going to instruct our database manager to return control of the website to them. All of these things he could do on his own authority, it could all be over. There's still the issue of his improper behavior, but I can it, right now my concern is to resolve the issue for New Hampshire, make them whole first, then the LNC can deal with its own dirty house. But let's make let's let's clean up, let's make things whole for those people. But I'll tell you, there isn't the political will on the LNC to do a damn thing about the improper behavior of the chair. There isn't. I don't have the votes. Um, it takes a two-third vote to remove. Definitely do not that have that. Probably have the votes to do a censure, but what is what does that accomplish? It's a slap on the wrist that does nothing. I, I could just as easily slap on the wrist by saying, by just posting my opinion or going on your show with my opinion. That does as much good as a censure. A censure is a waste of time. Or potentially a majority of LNC members could write a letter and ask for his resignation. Maybe that will happen, but he's not going to resign. So just like I'm saying to the people in New Hampshire who are unhappy with their board, heh, this is life. Vote, vote them out next time. Me, if I don't like what's going on, there's no political will on the LNC. Count the noses of the people who don't have the political will and vote them out. And I'm sure plenty of people are saying about me, vote me out. That's the process. But anyone expecting there to be reckoning on the LNC, there ain't. There ain't. I, I'd probably make the motion anyway, because I make motions on principle, not whether I'm going to win or not. And I'm already, you know, not the most popular person because I always say what I think. But if anyone expects anything to actually come out of that, it isn't. We couldn't expel Arvin for the crap that was going on then. You know, if it, it it's not going to happen. It's it's just not going going to happen. I'm just telling people realistically. But maybe write your LNC representatives and maybe you'll change their mind because Half of the people on the LNC are actual politicians. I don't consider myself a politician and I'm not living to be reelected. My life isn't surrounded on being secretary of the national party. I like it, but I'll live no matter what. Um, but some people really love that position. So maybe if you say you're not going to vote for them, you'll change their mind. I don't know. I would love to see a reckoning on the LNC, but the LNC now, unfortunately, is going to be in a second term of not holding to the highest principles, in my opinion. And most of the people, the majority that I think I have, have all said to me, we don't have the votes. Well, look, I, I have to, you have to be impartial on some level. And by the way, I, I think I'm in sympathy with your view that people on the LNC should not belong to a caucus, that they should resign from that caucus, that because it's it's a bad image that it gives the impression that they're they're there as a delegate from their caucus as opposed to a representative of all the people in their region. So I I agree with you very much on that. And so I don't, you know, I I'm not looking for you to endorse a particular caucus, but it is the Tom Woods show. And at the end of hearing all this frustrating stuff, I can't just say, all right, well, thanks for joining me. I'll see you later. I have to say to people, what can be done? I have to, I have to. So this is not you. You're not implicated in this in any way. You're an innocent bystander who's stuck here on the Tom Woods <laughs> show. Okay. Well, <laughs> you have me hostage. <laughs> well, <laughs> while I say to people, look, if, if, if you want to support the libertarian ideas that you hold dear and take seriously and believe are necessary for peace and prosperity, then you sh then join the LP and join the Mises Caucus in particular, which is made up of all, you will recognize these people and their ideas and their issues. I mean, for example, I don't see how you look at what's going on in the, in the country and what the US does around the world and think 
that the central bank is not an issue worth talking about. That is the lifeblood of the empire. The Federal Reserve is the lifeblood of the empire. And if it's, well, it's kind of crankish to talk about the Federal Reserve because a lot of crankish people talk about it. So let's instead talk about, uh, maybe we should have a monetary rule where the Fed increases the money supply 3% a year. Or maybe we just don't talk about that at all. We just say taxes are too high. All right, if you want to do that, but we want to go to the heart of what's wrong. And that is one, and I don't care that no one's talking about it. That's why we have to talk about it. Issues like that or the empire. And yeah, have the stones to call it an empire. It's an empire, and not just, well, this does not serve U.S. interests. I don't talk that way. I don't use regime speak language like that. And neither does the Mises caucus. Now, yes, that makes us not respectable and not fashionable. Well, we've tried the so-called respectable, fashionable route. Doesn't go anywhere. These people are going to hold us in contempt no matter what words we use, what vocabulary, what formulation. Doesn't matter. Th these people hate our guts no matter what we do. And by these people, I mean the establishment that have screwed up the lives of, of countless Americans with their lockdowns, their, their boom-bust cycles, their stupid wars based on propaganda. We're against all that, and we're for plain speaking. And if that's you, then join the, the LP, lp.org, and then go over to the, join the Mises Caucus, which you can join at takehumanaction.com and do something about it. Now, that's my editorializing. And, and I exempt you from that, even maybe in your heart of hearts, you, you're saying, good for you, old Woods, but that is not your role as a member of the LNC. Uh, your role is to, is to be impartial in adjudicating disputes, and it sure seems to me that that's what you're doing in this case. So thank you very much, Karen Ann Harlos. I really uh, appreciate that, Tom. And one other thing I did want to add, I'm sorry, because this is so frenetic, and one thing that makes this whole thing very personal to me and why I say in defending New Hampshire, I'm defending Colorado by proxy. What happened in New Hampshire with them electing a whole new board of primarily Mises people who ran on a platform of more bold messaging, that just happened in Colorado. So do I think there's potentially an LNC gun pointed at Colorado? You bet the entire board of Colorado thinks so. Everyone last night at the board meeting is like, we need to decouple our data now. They're scared. And they. Sh I can't blame them entirely because there is a group of some people in Colorado who aren't happy with the election, who could, because they're on the more pragmatist side, perhaps wield their influence and try to do a New Hampshire and Colorado. So this very is very, very real and personal to me for my home state because we have a messaging strategy has not yet been approved by the board, but I can guarantee you that Mr. Bishop Henchman will not like it. I can guarantee you that you probably will. Maybe not. It might be a little bit too spicy for your taste. It will be more artfully worded than New Hampshire because I'm going to be involved and I've been doing this a long time and I know how to get away with saying some of those radical things. Everyone has said my substitute for the child labor thing, they wouldn't have had, well, I think they still would have had a problem with it, but they all admitted that it was worded better. But some of the things Colorado is planning, we, we have a strategy called basically make your own media. We did this before New Hampshire. We already had the strategy in place before New Hampshire. New Hampshire just proved it could be done. They made their own media because the media ignores us. We're determined in Colorado to make a spectacle out of ourselves in what we believe is a good, bold, libertarian way. And we are going to make media just like New Hampshire did, which means we're going to have a target on our backs. And the LNC better think twice because the birthplace of the Libertarian Party, you're not going to attack us. That's all I have to say is nobody better be looking our way because we're, if it gets approved, again, the board hasn't passed it, but we ran on this platform and we have some ideas that are going to say to New Hampshire, hold my beer. Not, it's not going to be racist. It's not going to be bigoted. It's not going to be pure 4chan shock for shock value, but it is going to be libertarian messages that moderate candidates wish we wouldn't say. They will not like it. Our goal is to offend all the right people. Good for you. Because why not at this point? Why, why the heck not? Playing nice and pretending that if we play nice, we'll, we're going to get anywhere. Well, we've had a long time to try out that theory. We really have. So why the heck not? And you have a lot of politically homeless people right now 
who are deeply dissatisfied with their two alleged choices. And it's time to to try to, and you don't you don't reach those people through the, I don't know, through boring messaging. I just don't see how you, you gotta you jolt don't. people. You gotta jolt. I mean, I myself was jolted out of my neoconservatism. I, I favored all the wars and all this and that. And I had to be jolted out of it by people who said, what is the matter with you? You should know better than this, right? You're you're the one who goes around lecturing everybody about moral relativism and we need to have morality and blah, blah, blah. And yet you're just, your morality consists of, well, whatever the US government says, I approve of. What the hell kind of morality is that? I mean, I had to have somebody grab me by the collar. I didn't have somebody say, well, you know, if you think about, maybe we could, <laughs> nothing like well, that would have gotten through to me. There, there's an analogy, and it's a biblical analogy, which I know will resonate with you, might not with others, but I, I believe it can be applied to secular life, that in the Bible, there's a the letter to the seven churches. And one thing God says to one of the seven churches is, this I have against you. You are neither hot nor cold. I would be, I would that you would be hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That is what the voters are doing to the Libertarian Party right now. They don't want lukewarm messaging. So they're vomiting us out of their mouth. We need to be hot. Yes, yes, exa that's exactly right. That is exactly right. The worst thing you can be is lukewarm. Be hot or cold. Be hot or cold. And, and, exactly. And, and incidentally, that is, this is, we'll wrap up on this. That is the advice that the guy who taught me email marketing, Ben Settle, gives. He says, he, and he used that exact verse. He says, what you want, he says, yeah, my emails sometimes offend people in that I'm, I can be very openly political on some, on some things, on some uncomfortable topics. And that enrages some people. But what it means is, I want, he says, I want people to either love me or hate me. The last thing I want is for them to just not want to take any action whatsoever. And what it means is the people who wind up really following me are on fire for me, that they, they, these are the people who each one of them is worth 10 people because of their zeal and energy, because, because they respond to somebody who is willing to be different from everybody they encounter normally. Anyway, we, we have to wrap up. I appreciate you taking all this time out of your day, Karen and Harlos. Thanks so much. I thank you, Tom, and I look forward to seeing you in October. All right, everybody, that's our episode. Tomorrow, we're gonna step back from all the crazy current events and dive into some libertarian theory because, doggone it, that's what we do from time to time on The Tom Wood Show. Then Zuby, rapper and podcaster, whose Twitter feed, I don't think I've ever disagreed with anything on it. It's just absolutely great. Uh, he'll be Friday. And then next week, Adam Curry. You remember him as an MTV VJ. And of course, he is co-host of the No Agenda podcast. He's coming back to the show. So lots of great things coming up. If you like and appreciate what's going on here, then join me as a supporting listener over at supportinglisteners.com. Warm my heart and get yourself a whole lot of great goodies. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.